So, we come to the last in the series, which is the collision detection. We have the things to glide with, we have the things that move around, but we don't actually have any checks. Uh, collision detection can be quite heavy, i found, generally. It's uh, something that, that takes a lot of processor time. So, uh, we have a purpose-designed command to d speed things up slightly. So we've got nine things to collect, te check collision with, so we'll have another for loop, and good practice to make that a local variable, just in case we use it somewhere else that uses i. And our special command, which is called hit, and it has three parameters, which which are the two sprite numbers, the player, player zero, the uh, sprite we're checking against, one of the number sprites, which is one to nine, and finally, the distance, which I discovered experimentally previously, was 12. Now, this is the distance between the anchor points, which is normally the centre, but doesn't have to be, of the sprite. Um, you can ha it's, um, it's as calculated by um, square the squares of the distance x and y, and taking the square root of that, the normal distance between two points calculation. And this returns non-zero if, um, pardon me, this returns non-zero if you've got a collision. You usually have to determine this number experimentally. It's a kind of feel thing within the game. You kind of t have to tinker with it. There's, you, you can have a rough guess as to what it is, depending on the size of the sprites and so on. But it, it it's something that you kind of have to try it and just adjust it by one either way until it just sort of seems right, which I know is terribly vague, but that's what I've discovered. Uh, right, so we've got a multi-line uh, if here, if you notice the above uh, ones, they've all been if then, classic basic. This allows multi-lines with else's and to be nested, um, and it's because you're going to do rather more than you could do it on one line, but it'd be a bit unreasonable. So we want to update our score first, so we add i, which as well as being the sprite number is also the score for that. Um, so we add that to the score, and then we draw our score to refresh it. Now we obviously need to move the uh, collectible thing somewhere else, because it needs need, you know it can't be in the same place otherwise it'll prompt the glide again and finally we need a little sound effect we have sfx sound um I'll be honest is a weak point of the neo at the moment um, there is a project to do it over hdmi which may make it considerably better but at the moment we are spectrum level beepers um Stuff stuff would work, you know, if we if we produce a much better sound system. The old the old sound will still work exactly as it did before, but this kind of makes sound effects with, um, you know, by playing sequences of notes very rapidly, and um, you know there are sort of trills and laser shots and so on. It's not great, but it does work. So um, that should be it. There we go, so there we go, let's see if it'll work, yeah, there we go. And as we move around, we collect the numbers and so on, and... Now, you can see a, a few flaws there. Uh, firstly, the sprites are always on top, so if you want the uh, numbers to be on top, you, you basically can't. There's only so much we can do with a Pico. Um, but you could uh, reserve an area for the numbers. You can make it smaller. Or you could just live with it. Um, also, th this is something that does happen, which you can see, because there's a lot of text on there, which is because we've been pressing keys in the keyboard, and they've gone into the keyboard buffer queue. And um, it, uh, it you know, at the end it thinks you've typed in some which you need to just ignore. Or you can use in keys in a loop to empty the buffer. Um, it only stores the first, the last 64 keys you've pressed. So it's very straightforward to do. Um, there's also no, no wrapping in this. There's no we're game over or title screen or anything like that. But you get that. Uh, the other thing that actually this shows is down here in the corner which you can see which is the overlap we are doing XOR sprites here 
um, it may try replacing them with paint and, and um, repaint sprites which is where basically when you move a sprite you um, erase it and then when you redraw it you repaint, it, re you repaint any sprites in the area you erased which uh, can uh, ripple through um, but at the moment it's exclusive ore which uh, you can see very badly on this one these two are very close together and you can see they've they've confused each other um, actually in my experience of writing and playing games including this it usually works quite well it's you don't tend to get this very often this is unusual in that most of the sprites are static anyway um, you know you, I mean, you could jazz this up by having them move around but anyway, that's the end of this. Um, if you uh, wanted to run it on the real thing, it will look exactly the same. It will sound the same. And uh, it's just a matter of copying the graphics.gfx file and the uh, bass file called program.bass onto a USB key or an SD card, plugging it in and loading it in like any other basic program. Um, you can also now squirt it down serial port. That's something fairly new by uh, connecting a uh, R2303 or FT232 uh, USB to serial port to your PC and uh, plugging it into the UX, UEXT connector. And uh, then you can uh, put it in a mode where it just accepts um, packets of data and and uh, loads and runs the programs which works quite well if you want to cross develop but actually run it on the real hardware um, but it's fine just to run it on the emulator or you can do the whole thing on the hardware except the graphics anyway i hope that was informative thank you for listening and good morning <laughs>